welcome back. Uh, last week was great. People looking forward to uh, the second week with you, Paul. I just remind you, um, uh, because this was a question that was raised during the week to me. So when we do these very large webinars, um, you are not visible to the speaker. But because the speakers would like to have eye contact with you, engage you, um, see your face, get to know, put a face with the name. Um, if you if you're not, you know, in the hair curlers or not ashamed or embarrassed or you took <laughs> your teeth out already and you don't want to put them back in, it would be great if you would let Paul see your face because I think he would enjoy that. Um, the other thing is just keep in mind, people have asked me already, every one of these sessions is recorded by our, our tech assistant, um, Matthew Moby John, and probably by Saturday or Sunday, he puts them up. So if you want to see the recording, you go to the Spirit Alive webpage on the Sisters of St. Joseph of Brentwood website. And we have a number of tabs. One of them is recordings, and that will take you directly to our YouTube channel where you can access the recording. So if you missed anything, or, or more importantly, I think if you wanna hear it again, because there's so much uh, going on here, I, I think um, you should know about that. And um, these programs are free. If you wanna make a donation, you know I'm always happy to get that. So I have to put in a little uh, commercial for donations. But other than that, take it away, Paul. We're interested to see how you redeem Genesis 2. <laughs> <laughs> if such things can be done. I just took my own curlers out of my hair. Oh. <laughs> I came on camera, Maria. So. Um, but welcome back, everybody. It's great to be with you again um, as we continue this exploration of the Bible and ecology. Um, to our new folks, welcome. To returners, welcome as well. Um, I want to do a, just a quick reminder here about our process and Q&A stuff, just to make sure we keep up with that. Um, you're welcome if you have a midstream question to unmute and ask it, uh, or we can wait until the end of the session and do some discussion and Q&A commentary at the end. Either of those is fine with me. You're also most welcome to use the chat function if you like to, um, to chat in questions um, along the way or flag things that you'd like to hear more about. Happy to kind of use the chat in that way as well. And I'll be dropping a couple of you know, recommended readings, resources, things in case folks want to explore more um, going forward from the session as we go along tonight. So that is just a quick reminder, uh, recap of our process stuff. Um, second thing I'll say is that we're doing Genesis 2 and 3 tonight, our second sort of story of creation we'll get into in a minute. Um, and next week we'll be looking at the Psalms. And I will put this in the chat now, and I'll put it in the chat again at the end. Um, but there are a few, obviously, there are too many psalms to do in one night, uh, all of them. So the specific psalms that we're going to look at, I just dropped in the chat. They're listed there. So if you want to make note of that now or later on, um, maybe take a minute and read over those before next week's session. That'll be a great way to kind of set yourself up to be able to enter even more fully into the session. So with that said, um, we will go ahead and get started with our exploration of, of Genesis 2 and 3, all right? So just to set that up for tonight, the first thing that I would say is that as we look at these creation texts, it's always important to remind ourselves that, as we discussed last week, even more than understanding kind of the origins of things, where things came from, you know, those, those kinds of things, what these creation texts help us do is reflect in a deep sort of theological way on the relationship between humans, us, our species, and the rest of the natural world, both positively and negatively. It can go either way when we look at these texts. Also, in Genesis 2 in particular, we're going to be talking about the relationship between men and women. We're going to see the original biblical justification for patriarchy and the subordination and subjugation of women, which we know has been a historical fact that we are continuing to wrestle with. Um, and we'll, so we'll look at that as we go along. And we're also going to take a look at how those two things are interrelated. 
how this sort of biblical justification for patriarchy and the subjugation of women relates to humanity's often exploitative and destructive attitudes toward the natural world, because they're not unrelated. There actually is a very important link um, that we can make between those. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we get into it. So those are just a few framing things to set us up for the exploration of the text that we're gonna begin right now. So I am gonna, as I did last week, project for you all the text of Genesis 2. Can everybody see it there on the screen? Just so we have something to glance at as we, as we go along. And we'll begin at the end of the previous story because oddly enough, when the texts of Genesis were put together by their original editors, somehow the seventh day of the first story, the day of rest and the establishment of the Sabbath, wound up at the beginning of chapter two. And this is an interesting little sort of historical tidbit, but one of the things that's important to recognize about that is that these chapter numbers and verse numbers that we're so familiar with are not original to the text. They're editorial editions that were added along the course of history. And so for whatever reason, there's this convention of, of breaking the last day of the first story of creation, the seven day story, at this point. And then from there, we get this mysterious little first half of verse four. And I want to spend a minute on this because this has raised many scholarly and uh, pastoral eyebrows over the course of, of history. Look at this line. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. All right. Some scholars have said that works as a perfect follow-up to verse three because on it, God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, the end, right? That that could be the end of the story. But it works equally well, if not better, as the beginning of a new story. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth, and so on, right? You can use that little fragment of verse uh, four to either be an ending or a beginning. And the most significant thing about this, though, from a scholarly perspective, is the use of this word generations, called a toledot, you know, uh, which is this word that usually signals the beginning of sort of a list in Hebrew of something that came after something else. So that often leads us to sort of think of it as a beginning, but it could go both ways. So I just wanted to mention that as a little bit of a textual commentary, because kind of an odd, interesting point. What this definitely tells us, though, is that we are entering into a new, different story of creation. And so many of you are probably familiar with this already, but the, the first three chapters of Genesis contain two different creation accounts. And it's understood by scholars that they come from two different literary traditions. One is known as the priestly tradition, uh, or P, just the letter P, and the other one is known as the Yahwist tradition, or the letter J. Now, lest people doubt, you know, well, why is that? You know, what is the case here? The most significant thing in this transition that's going to get us into this sort of different idea of God, very different idea of God, is that God beginning in the second story here at verse four has a different name. In all of chapter one, God is simply referred to as God. But beginning here at two, four, God is referred to as the Lord God with this small caps Lord. And that is the name that is commonly spelled and, and pronounced as Yahweh, but it's understood as what's called the Tetragrammaton, the four letter name for God, Y-H-W-H. And it does not have vowels, it's not typically written with vowels in Hebrew, so it's an unpronounceable name. It's the name that God gives to Moses at the burning bush. But what this signals to us, this is what gives the Yahwist tradition its name, because this name, the Lord, is understood to be the proper name of God. So when you're reading your Bibles from now until the last day that you read them, just note and keep in mind that every time you see that small caps, L-O-R-D, that is the name Y-H-W-H being written in the Hebrew. That's what that is signaling. And why that's significant here is because the first story of creation doesn't use that name. It uses it the, just simply God to refer to God. And so this also is signaling to us that we're in a new story, a new tradition, a new sort of background. And that's going to be setting us up because 
not only is the name of God different, but the characterization of God and God's relationship to the world, which are foundational for understanding what this story says about creation and ecology, are different too. So we're into this new story. Now, a lot of people will ask, my students always ask, right, especially the really suspicious ones, like to say things like, well, there you go, proof that the Bible is totally, you know, rubbish. There's two stories of creation. Which one is true, right? Well, the ancient interpretive tradition of the church, especially among rabbis and other Jewish commentators, is that the first story of creation gives us sort of the, the cosmic universal God's eye view of the beginning, the origins of things, and that the second story zooms in right, and gives us the sort of up close and personal view of what was going on in the garden, right? Just one way of imagining, kind of a playful, midrashic kind of way of thinking about these kinds of things. But for our purposes, if we think back to last week and what we talked about with cultural and scientific cosmologies, what we can simply say is that we have two different cultural cosmologies, two different traditions of talking about the origins of the universe that are not so much about what really happened in the beginning, right? That would be a scientific cosmology, but about the meaning and purpose and values and, and orientation of these fundamental relationships between God and the world and humanity, God, the universe and humanity, all of creation and God kind of coming together. And that the ancient Hebrews held both of these stories to be authoritative representations of their experience of God, of who God is and what God cares about and those kinds of things. And so that's what we're going to really focus in on is that character element, not the explanatory, which one really happened, which one is right, which one's a better story of creation. No, what do these stories tell us about that three-part relationship between God humans, and all the rest of creation, which of course we're part of too, not to be separated, right? That would be anthropocentric and we don't want to go in that direction. All right, so that's our little intro to kind of setting up how we're going to read this text today. So the first thing I'll note as we get into the story itself is the order in which things are made. It's different from the first story. Whereas we were created last in the first story of creation, all right, in the, in, in the priestly account, we are, humans are created first, or perhaps it's better to say that a proto-human, a pre-human creature is created first. This creature, which God names Adam, Adam, right, which just means earth, um, a lot of scholars have referred to as the earthling or the groundling. That's what we see when we see this word, the man, we're seeing the reference to that name Adam, which means the, you know, the earth, an earthling or a groundling, because we're like a little clay creature, a little dirt creature that God has built up and breathed into the breath of life, right? That is um, that force of life. You remember last week when we were looking at the first verse, first couple of verses of Genesis 1, I commented on that word ruach, that word, the breath, the wind, sometimes translated as spirit, we're getting that same image here of breath being the life force, that which God breathes creation into existence through. But in this case, it starts out with the little earthling, the little groundling, that first earth creature. And so that's why I like to call this, rather than the first human, a sort of proto-human, because we're just setting the stage for what's going to unfold. So here, I would just like to point out and, and give you all for a moment of reflection, the fact that this is a creature made from the dirt, made from the earth itself. The human is made from humus, as uh, Bill Brown, a biblical scholar, likes to say, the human is made from humus. We are made from the soil. If we're ever looking for an ecological connection, a connection between us and the rest of the planet, how much closer could we get than this bodily connection between us and the soil. And interestingly enough, that's not too far off from kind of how evolution happened. You know, the, the famous image of the creature that is crawling and then gradually standing. And then, you know, the last image has a briefcase or something like that in some renderings of this, you know, the sort of contemporary society in there. We emerged quite literally out of the dust of the earth, out of the crust of the earth. 
And we are that animated dirt, that composite of breath and dirt. And that is the same breath. And I would emphasize this as well, that the scriptures will tell us throughout the, this first chapters of the Hebrew Bible is shared by all creatures. All creatures breathe the same breath of life, breathe the same ruach, right? That breath of God. And so we're united both by coming up out of the earth and by the fact that everything that lives, everything that breathes, shares the same breath, which is God's own breath. So imagine that as a model for connecting God, humans, and the rest of creation. There's so many opportunities already emerging out of this, this idea of the human person, of the groundling that we can start to play with. So that's our first thing here. So the next thing is that what God does, right, is God plants a garden, and places the, the Adam, the groundling within it. So the little earth creature gets put in the garden. And the garden is wonderful. It's full of trees and flowers. We get this great early you know, Hebrew cosmology that mentions the Tigris and the Euphrates, right? What we learn in middle school now and, and high school now, this Mesopotamian cradle of civilization and all that, right? Is, is evoked right here, um, they had a similar cosmology. So we get the mention of those two famous rivers and all those kind of things. And the garden is a place of abundance. The garden is a place where life is flourishing. There is fruit, there is trees, there, you know, all of these kinds of things around. And out of this, as God places us in the garden, God indicates the, the sort of basic definition of the human vocation. And Pope Francis makes a lot out of this in Laudato Si for people that took the previous course with me or have read Laudato Si on their own. The human vocation is to till and to keep the garden. To till and to keep the garden. Now think about that image, right? Our first vocation to be a gardener is to be a keeper, a caretaker of the land, to be the one who cultivates the land so that it can remain fruitful and even be maximized in its fruitfulness. This isn't about destruction or, you know, analogies with sort of industrial farming today. I'll say more about that in a second, which imposes, sort of forces our will on the earth. But just like God collaborates with the earth, remember all those, let the earth bring forth, let the waters be filled, right? We are put in the garden as sort of the agent of that life-giving work, the agent that carries out that work to till and to keep, to cultivate. We are gardeners first and foremost, right? And I think to be a gardener, and, and many of us maybe quick show of hands on the screen, right? If, if you grow any plants on your own or you ever have, right? A good gardener knows that to be an effective gardener means that you have to love and care for and nurture what it is that you're trying to grow. If you just try to force it to grow, it's probably going to die, right? The classic brown thumb sort of, you know, situation. Um, and so there's that relational aspect here that we're talking about, right? And, and after all, I mean, that's what good farmers do, good gardeners do, right? They, they, they bring out the best of what can be done in ways that accord with nature, in ways that work with the sort of naturally fruitful processes that our ecosystems already possess, that potential is already there. We just help things do better through our love and through our care. Now, I would personally set that up as quite in contrast to contemporary industrial or factory farming practices as we talk about it. Here's a eco contemporary ecological connection. Often those processes, which they, they, they destroy the topsoil, they sap all the nutrients out of the soil and they use you know, heavy amounts of pesticides in conjunction with gen genetically uh, modified crops, GMOs as we call them, right? Where basically you, you make a crop seed that can withstand anything that you pour on it, right? And, and is basically immune to bugs and you dump tons of pesticides on it so that it doesn't kill the plant but it kills all the bugs that want to eat the plant because they're bugs and they got to eat too, you know, all of these kinds of things. But that's not really gardening in this sense, right? That's an example of what Pope Francis in Laudato Si calls the technocratic paradigm, using science technology to exploit nature, to force our will 
on nature in a way that contradicts what natural processes can do on their own. But the vocation of a gardener, right, starts with being able to listen to the land and to learn from it, to be in dialogue with our plant brothers and sisters, you know, little Francis of Assisi kind of thing there, you know, brother tomato and sister, you know, uh, orange tree or whatever it is, you know, um, and, and out of that to find joy in the productivity of the land, the delicious flavors we can eat, the great dishes we can make, the food we can share with our neighbors, the hungry people who are in need that we can feed with things that we grew ourselves. All of that is right there in this image of the garden. And I think there's a lot of sort of beautiful opportunities for imagining how, you know, um, we can use this image of the garden to kind of unpack this stuff in that way. And on this, if you're, if you like this kind of, you know, line of thinking, there's a couple of authors I would recommend to you and I'll, I'll drop their names in the chat. One is Wendell Berry, especially, or sorry, Norman Wiersba, especially the book, The Paradise of God. And uh, Wendell Berry, the essayist and poet, um, you know, has a book called The Art of the Commonplace, which was edited by Wiersba. So if you're interested in garden imagery and the relationship between Christianity and the earth, those are two wonderful, wonderful sources to go to that I'd recommend. All right, so getting back to the story here, getting back to the story. God makes next an inter interesting statement here. It is not good that the man should be alone. It is not good that Adam, the groundling, should be alone. And so, you know, most interpreters have seen this as a signal that God sees human creation as being incomplete. Now, it's fascinating, as you will maybe have noticed, is that out of this comes a parade of animals. First, God tries in, in making a helper as the Adam, the groundling's partner, all of these different animals. He bring, you know, finches and, and crows and deer and whatever. And, you know, Adam, you know, the, the earth creature looks at the deer and says, you know, you're pretty and everything, but I don't see the long-term potential or something like that, right? For whatever reason, it doesn't work out uh, between, you know, the, the earthling and these animals that God brings as a potential partners, right? And clearly this is intended to be like a life partner, a sexual partner. And so there's some humor here um, in the sense that, that these obviously aren't going to match, right? But what does happen is that the, the Adam, the earthling, gives them their names, which some people have read as a sign of control or domination and other people have read as a sign of relationship, uh, mutuality, something like that. We don't have a sort of definitive answer on this, but it can be read in multiple ways. And so because God's experiment doesn't have the desired outcome at first, right? Um, God decides to try another approach. And we all know the story. God puts the groundling to sleep take some flesh from the side, you know, the rib as it's typically represented. I'll say something about that in a second and builds it up into another creature, which is then called the woman. And then when the woman stands before the man, the man rejoices. This one at last, emphasized there, at last, he's happy about this. Finally, this is somebody, God, you got it right. You know, this is the one I've been waiting for, this kind of thing, um, you know, comes out of this because out of man, this one was taken. And you might notice in a lot of Bibles, the woman and man are capitalized here, and they're not capitalized up here. And this is because in the Hebrew, this is the first time that we get the actual words for woman and man as they're understood. Rather than Adam, which has this earthling, you know, characteristic, we get Isha and Ish, right, which are the Hebrew words for woman and man. So this is the first time we get any sort of gender differentiation, any sort of sexual differentiation happens here when it says this one will be called woman for out of man this one was taken. All right. So that brings us to the creation of humanity. Now, I want to offer a quick commentary and a couple key points here, because one of the big things we're going to discuss is the relationship, as I said, between the history of the subjection of and violence against the earth, like the industrial farming paradigm, and the subjection of and violence against women throughout history. They're linked in this story. Um, this is heavy stuff, uh, but many scholars, including uh, my mentor, Elizabeth Johnson, who's here with us and a member of the CSJ community, um, has clearly, clearly pointed out this connection. And I think it's vital to mention it. So a couple comments here. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand how this text has been interpreted in a way that supposedly legitimates the subjection of women to men. So one of the classic words here is this word helper. I will make a helper as, as the man's partner, right? 
there's a subordinate implication there, according to a lot of male interpreters. Let's be clear about that. But a famous uh, feminist you know, critic of the Bible, Phyllis Tribble, um, started a conversation where she points out in particular that this word azer, this word that means helper, that it gets used, is most commonly used for not subordinate figures, but for God. So when we hear this word, the Lord is my help, it's the same word in Hebrew that is at the root of this word for helper here. So Tribble naturally asks, wherein lies the subordination? If this is a word that is primarily used for God, we can't assume that this helper translation, which is an English translation of a Hebrew word, right, necessarily implies some sort of subjection or subordination. So that argument doesn't hold a lot of weight. The second thing a lot of people talk about is the taking of the rib that you know, the woman is a secondary creature or a derivative creature because she's taken out of man and the rib is this kind of thing. An alternative translation of the word for rib that it's good to be aware of is side. In fact, at the time that this text was probably written, side, like the side of something, was the more common you know, understanding of this word. So the flesh is taken from the side and, and the woman is set beside the man right? Not in the sense of a hierarchical relationship, but in the sense of sort of being together there in the garden. The rib usage is, uh, it comes out later on in the history of interpretation, all right? Third here, and perhaps most interestingly, I think, um, it's not even clear that we have this sort of gender differentiation, and this is Tribble again, until those words, ish and isha, the capitalized man and woman, show up. Before this, all we hear about is the groundling or the earthling, not a male human, not a male human as we typically understand it. And this, funnily enough, interestingly enough, here's a great image for you all, has led some people in the history of, of the tradition to say that this moment of the creation of man and woman is not so much the creation of a new creature as it is the separation of one creature into two. And there are even these early sort of figurative drawings and, and discussions where they talk about the figure having both male and female body parts at the same time, and God kind of splits them down the middle and pulls them apart, right? And that that's what's happening at this moment. Um, I always ask when I think about that image, which way did the knees go, right? Like who was in charge of the direction that the creature walked? I don't know how that works, but there you go. This sort of ancient imagination and play there, right? So I would say that in some, at least in this moment of the creation story, there is nothing here that necessarily implies gender-based subjection or subordination. All of the arguments that people have used, again, male scholars throughout history have used, um, are interpretations, extrapolations from what the text actually says. There's nothing here that necessarily gets there, at least not yet, but we'll get to that in a second, all right, when we go to chapter three. So the last thing I want to say here before we move in that direction is that scholars like Johnson and Tribble and others, that uh, Rosemary Edford Ruther and others, have pointed out to us, right, that it's important to recognize, too, that the traditional gender of the earth is also feminine. We talk about Mother Earth, right, that classic example. And there's a good case that you know, on the basis of the hierarchical rendering of the male and female, which Greek philosophy, right, says, uh, accords with things like the rational mind, links that to humans, and then, you know, emotionality, materiality, physicality gets linked to the feminine, to femininity, that that logic, which has enabled men to dominate women throughout the history of the world, also corresponds with humanity's domination of the earth. And that entitlement, that sense of sort of having power over, there's a parallel logic here. And if you want a great intro to this, I'm going to shout out Beth, who's with us here in the room. If you want a great intro to this, um, Johnson's work, uh, Women, Earth, Creator, Spirit, is a great place to go if you want to find out more about this and get a great intro to this paradigm that we're talking about. All right. So all of this then coming again back to the text, brings us to Genesis 3 and the famous narrative of the talking snake, the tree, and the fruit, right, which is not an apple, 
despite all artistic renderings, just a fruit, uh, you know, and, and um, this moment in the garden when we have this crafty old servant that tricks the first humans, these first people into, right, doing wrong, into going against God's command that they not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, right, the famous sort of thing here. So one thing I want to mention in setting up again this gendered stuff as we get into this is that up to this point, the woman is not yet named Eve. That does not happen yet. So it's actually improper at this point when we're talking here to talk about Adam and Eve. We're not at that point yet. She's just woman at this point. And there's significance to that in certain interpretations of this text. Now, these details aren't necessarily, you know, of signal importance for our analysis, but they really, really, really point toward a larger point, like that point about Eve. I think we always just think Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, it's automatic, right? But the fact is that sometimes we, and I would say church teaching, and I would say church leaders and other people, internalize interpretations or aspects of interpretations that may not be actually warranted by the text. And probably the biggest of these, most harmful of these, is the idea that women are by nature subordinate to men, less than. And another is that dominion, as we talked about in Genesis 1, means domination, license to kill, license to exploit. And so I think recognizing that sometimes we kind of walk around with these pre-programmed ideas that may or may not actually reflect what the text says is super important because a lot hangs in the balance. The well-being of creation, the well-being of women often hangs in the balance. And we need to hold on to that and remind ourselves to get back to the text and remind leaders to get back to the text and pay attention to what scholars are saying because you know sometimes we know things about things. And I think that that's really important. So, you know, we know the basic contours of the story here. The serpent entices the woman with the promise of being like God, wisdom, knowing good and evil. And she eats the fruit and gives it to her husband. Now, why nobody ever asks, has anybody ever heard this? Why is there a talking snake in this garden? Nobody ever seems to ask that question. I've always wondered that, but there you have it. We just assume that it's part of the story, right? Now, notably, as Tribble points out, Phyllis Tribble, the man here is completely passive right? Given the way that gender roles have played out, I, I always imagine that, you know, he's on the couch watching Sports Center or something like that. And that's not something I support, but I just want to say he's just sort of there. And she says, you know, dinner's ready and gives him the fruit and there we go, right? They eat, they break God's command, right? And their eyes are open. We get that detail here that their eyes are open. And upon finding it out in this odd dialogue where God asks them, where are you? And they admit to being naked. God becomes aware, furiously aware, um, that they have violated the command to eat from the tree that was forbidden. They've eaten the forbidden fruit, as it's called. And here God launches into this diatribe, this, this, this threefold punishment of the uh, man and woman and in fact of the earth and creation. And I wanna really focus us here because this is huge for our thinking about the Bible and ecology. All right, so after a little blame game where the man says, she made me do it. And then the woman says that talking snake made me do it, right? Kind of funny little mythological moment there. Um, this leads to the punishment. So the first punishment here is against the serpent. The serpent is punished to go on his belly and to eat the dust of the earth. It seems that the serpent was probably imagined as having legs, standing up, moving around in some other way, and is now condemned to sort of slither on the earth and eat on the earth and eat the dirt, right? The second part of the serpent's punishment is the punishment of enmity, a relationship of adversity between the serpent and the woman, which many interpreters thinking ecologically have said is symbolic of the adversity between humans and animals that we continue to experience in the world. In reflecting on the sort of fact that animals run away or are trying to attack us, especially in an ancient society like this, there is this sort of symbolic representation in this moment when God says, I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, right? Of this adverse adversarial relationship between humans and animals. And it's a relationship of violence because the snake is trying to eat 
the maybe the offspring of the woman and the woman is striking at the head of the snake right trying to beat it down and keep it from doing harm so we get this adversarial and violent relationship established that's the first piece the second piece of the punishment is the punishment of woman again not yet eve the punishment of woman the first one is childbearing pain Thanks a lot, God, right? In pain, you will bring forth children. Now, what's interesting about this that I want to point out is that it's not just about the pain of childbearing, but implied here, implied here, just as with the relationship between humans and animals, is the implication that before this moment of punishment, childbirth was painless. Because if it has to be introduced as a punishment, then that means that it wasn't that way before right? Or it was moderately painful. I've never given birth to a child, right? I don't know how painful it is, but I do know that it is painful. So I will increase your pangs in childbearing, right? Look at that. And then the second part of the woman's punishment, perhaps the most terrifying and horrifying, you know, given the history of the subjection of women in history and, and in the church as well, is this line, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. All right? Now, what we have here in that he shall rule over you, and I think it's vital, I can't say this strongly enough, is an establishment of a historical warrant, a historical justification for patriarchy, right? That's what we're being given here. But in the same way that it's important to recognize that the human-animal relationship was probably not adversarial before the punishment, we have to keep in mind that the subordination of woman to man here results from sin. It is an after effect, a punishment, an unhappy outcome of the disobedience of humanity. It is therefore not part, Pache Thomas Aquinas, who says that it is, not part of the original order of creation. Because if God intended women to be subject from the beginning, God would not need to establish patriarchy as part of this punishment for humanity's disobedience. In the beginning, God established men and women as equals, right? Because they have to be punished with this undisordered power relationship. And that's what it is. It's disordered. It's sinful. All right. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat that. Like, obviously, this is meant to be what we call an etiology, an explanation for the origins of something. And this is an etiology of patriarchy. It's an answer to the question, why do women have to listen to men? Why are women subject to men in society? That is what this text is trying to do. And at the same time, I want to say that's not okay. And even more so, that is not what God intended. And that's going to have really great significance for what we're going to talk about here in just a moment with the, the outcomes of this. Now, at the same time, if this is the result of sin, then right, we, we might ask whether we should be working to reverse against, working against the results of the fall, to fight against patriarchy, to fight against these adversarial relationships between humanity and, and, and creation and animals, and to work on behalf of that original order of equality and nonviolence and harmony that God seemed to establish in the beginning. And I'll return to that point in a minute. Let's go to the third punishment, though, to wrap this up. The final part of the punishment is a punishment of the man, of Adam, but also a punishment of the earth, right? God curses the ground and says that it is in toil that humanity will eat. Thorns and thistles the ground will bring forth. No longer will it be easy to work the earth as it was in the, the beautiful flourishing garden. Now there is this adversarial relationship established between humanity and the earth itself. Now, if that's not emblematic of our present day ecological crisis, I don't know what is. You know, we, we are living this adversarial relationship, seeing it all around us, seeing the effects of it, right, all around us. But here again, we have to recognize that this is not how things were intended. This is the result of sin. This is a fracture, a breakdown in the proper order of relationships. So 
God concludes this diatribe, of course, with the famous Ash Wednesday passage, you are dirt and to dirt you will return, right? A reminder of our mortality, a, a, a humbling sort of putting us in our place, you know, kind of conclusion that says, don't forget that you are this earth. But isn't it interesting that that is what God reminds Adam of at the end of this Con condemnation at the end of this punishment, that you are made of the dust of the earth and you will return to it. You are not gods. You are not licensed to do whatever you want. You are not permitted to have that kind of full control. That belongs to God alone. We, like everything else, are created. And that should tell us something about what it means to be human in relationship to God and what it means to live as creatures among creatures, you know, as all connected by this breath of life and the dirt and all this thing. And then we get the conclusion of the story, the expulsion of the garden, the naming of Eve, right? And all of that. Here is the moment in verse 20, where finally Eve gets her name, Eve, as we call her, right? So there we go. So that is the, the sort of deep interpretation that I want to offer of the text itself. Now, to conclude this and segue over, I just want to offer a few concluding reflections that to get us going in our discussion. All right, I'm going to take a sip of water here. All right, so first off, reflections. If the first sin is disobedience, and as so many people have said, pride, working to get above our given station, not being content with the world and the way of life that God gave us, then I think there's a lot to consider when it comes to thinking about how we use science and technology as instruments of domination and destruction. You know, we seem to never be content with our relationship to the land, and we do harm in the interest of this thing we call progress or growth, right, trying to get beyond, which is really a code word in most cases for using Earth's resources, using what the gifts, not resources, Paul, gifts, using the gifts that the Earth gives us um, destructively to advance that anthropocentric quest for control and domination. Again, the essence of what Pope Francis calls the technocratic paradigm. So that same disobedience, that same trying to get above our station is reflected in the present day any time our, our scientific and technological quests for use domination and exploitation in order to achieve their ends. And we know that they have, and that's what's led us into this present crisis of pollution and degradation and everything else. All right, first point. Second point, Wiersbe and others, who I mentioned a minute ago, have pointed out that this attitude of, of pride and sort of control is the opposite of gratitude and joy. Rather than love and appreciation, giving thanks for what we have, we seem to take and take and take, never having enough in this quest to grow. And this is the foundation of overconsumption, one of the other hallmarks of our ecological crisis. Genesis 2 seems to offer, you know, a stark reminder of what happens when we choose a path of destruction and exploitation and disobedience rather than acceptance, joy, and gratitude for wonderful gifts that God gives us all around us in creation. When we think about that ecologically, right, we immediately have to think about our economic systems, about consumerism, about taking more than we give, disrupting natural systems that are flourishing on their own as God has established them in order to advance our aims, to play God in that sense. That's represented symbolically here, I think. You know, to ask that question, how much is too much? Have we lost the ability to till and keep in the manner of cultivation and care rather than in the manner of killing and stealing and taking and destroying, right? Um, I think our banishment from the garden kind of symbolizes our banishment from that original order because we have this threefold fracture in the relationships. And that's the third point I wanna kind of end on here, which is that the threefold punishment as I've already started to sort of indicate that God inflicts that fracture in the original order is important for us as a baseline for recognizing not only the fallen sort of, you know, I don't really like that word, but the sort of broken relationship of, uh, of, of creation that we live within now, but it also signals to us what God actually intended in the creation of this garden, the goodness and flourishing of the earth and humans, 
feeding all of the animals and plants, allowing everything to exist, wonderful sort of joyous relationships of mutuality between women and men, right? All of these things are part of that original order, and that is what is wrecked by, broken by sin. So the adversity that we see, you know, among us and animals, the, the uh, adversity between women and men, the subjection of women and men, right? As I said, so much so that even though Thomas Aquinas says otherwise, right, it does not seem the case that this text, right, indicates any sort of fundamental subjugation of women. And I want to observe there, right, that this, this sort of assumption does appear in John Paul II's writings on gender and in the magisterium's justifications for denying women ordination. This stuff has concrete effects in people's lives. So this breakdown in those harmonious relationships, this loss of our vocation to be gardeners, partners in the work of life, this life of toil and struggle, it's all a far cry from that original order of, of creation that God established. And that to me really brings us to reflect on the extent to which we really trust in the idea of redemption, both for our earth and for women who have suffered so long the consequences of patriarchy that stems from, flows from a terrible interpretation of this text. Right, Because although the authors clearly intended to explain why the world is broken in these ways, including patriarchy, including ecological degradation, all of those kinds of things, that can only be true if women were not subordinate before the fall, if the earth were not broken before the fall. Right, And so if we trust that Christ in the death and resurrection, right, and we'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks, has brought about a new order of creation, has restored, in a sense, the original goodness and flourishing order of creation. And that is what the redemption of Christ does. And that includes gender and ecology and everything else. If we really believe that, right, then shouldn't the recognition that there is a different original order impose on us a sort of ethical mandate, a responsibility to work not on behalf of sort of the fallen order that we live within now, and not just to accept that, throw up our hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it, but to strive and to struggle against oppression and degradation as part of our faith in Christ, that there are these ethical demands that flow from that. If we really believe creation has been redeemed, then what do we choose to live for? That's the question that comes out. And I think the answer has to be that original order of the flourishing garden of life in all its ways, in all those kinds of things. And that, I think, also is sort of the essence of what it means to reclaim our vocation as gardeners who till and keep and work to sort of bring out the fullness of everything around us. And I think that that to me is one of the key insights here with deep consequences for reflecting on our present day ecological situation and all of these other issues that we've been naming. So that is our in-depth exploration of this text um, for tonight. And so we have about 30 minutes left and um, I wanna use those 30 minutes to open it up for questions, discussion, commentary, um, whatever it might be that folks want to bring out. Thank you so much for your attention. The floor is open. This is one of those moments in class when you just sort of stand there until somebody said, no, I'm just kidding, says something. Let me let me say this, just any initial sort of responses, reactions, sort of gut feelings that come away from uh, reading the text in this way. I'll start, maybe make it easier. I guess, you know, we've all read these texts so many times, but I was thinking that, you oh. know, so many times in people's lives, um, when things go wrong, they say, why did God do that? Or why did God mm -hmm. let that happen? What, and it just dawned on me listening to this text 
as your student here tonight, that this is an example of human beings in a sense, oh. because they wrote this text, oh. right? Recognizing in themselves their destructive power um, and putting actually the blame where the blame goes, not outside um, where God is, but in ourselves. Um, and I never thought about this that this text that way before, you know, after reading it so many times, but um, that's a, whoever wrote this text, I was thinking, um, or whoever, people, whoever put this together, uh, that was kind of a very bold thing to look at the disorder of the world around them and say, we did it. Um, yeah. And even in the world that we live in today, you have people denying that we're doing anything. You know, it was just part of the natural process. The world gets caught, the world gets cold, trees come and trees go. So I, I just, it's the, the first thing that struck me tonight, yeah. thinking uh, about what you said. Yeah, thank you, Maria. I, I really appreciate that and, and it resonates deeply with me because when we use that sort of cultural cosmology framing that we've been talking about, right? We are getting a people's interpretation. And it, again, it's authentic, it's authentic and it's authoritative, but it is a people's interpretation of their understanding of the world in relationship to the God that they believe in. Now, I don't wanna dismiss the fact that, for example, the attribution of patriarchy or the uh, you know breakdown in the relationships between humans and the earth is somehow excused Right. I don't want to say that this is somehow an excuse, but that is what they were trying to do, I think. Right now, whether or not and I always ask this to my students, you know, to think about whether or not anybody was conscious of that when they wrote the text. We don't know. You know, we don't know whether they were thinking, oh, actually, the implication of what we're writing is that this is not how God intended things to be. Right. They may have just been telling the story that they, as they had always told it in this particular way. But what we have to work with, and I think this is what's fun about biblical interpretation, is what the text gives to us. And it does give us this distinction between the sort of two orders of creation. And it also, as you said, Maria, does give us um, a recognition that we're the ones at fault here. We're the ones who caused this. And I think that that in itself can be a really valuable resource if we would, you know, rather than thinking of it from sort of God down to the world and saying, this is, you know, we actually said, hey, for, you know, about 3000 years, people have been recognizing in writing um, through these figurative stories, the fact that we have a broken relationship. We have a broken relationship with creation and that our intra-human relationships between women and men, et cetera, et cetera, are also broken. Um, that can be a valuable resource uh, if we can recognize it for moving a conversation forward. Um, if we recognize that in the redemption that has been gained by Christ, and that's what we're celebrating in this in this you know, season of Easter, if we recognize that that imposes sort of ethical responsibility on us. We can't just be content with these degraded and broken relationships. We are called as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to work on behalf of that redeemed order that, that Jesus sort of initiated, inaugurated. And um, so anyway, just a couple further reflections, kind of repeating what I already said, but, but I think you bring out some richness there, which is really wonderful. Thanks. Got some uh, a hand up, Arlene. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, yeah, okay. all right. Now we. Are. Uh, well, I was thinking as we were uh, as we were reading this and talking about this is that um, the idea of original sin uh, seems to play so much into our theology, and uh, it's kind of hard to explain. When we we live in a multicultural uh, community here, and you have people of many different faiths, and uh, well, you know, well, what do you mean? What do they? What do you mean by original sin? And in a sense, having to rethink this myself, uh, in terms of the, the story, maybe is about not being satisfied with themselves in the garden, uh, having to. Uh, accumulate and do more it's thinking that they have to make themselves better and so therefore uh if you're not really satisfied with yourself and who you are 
how are you going to be satisfied with what's around you? Uh, you start to uh, abuse it or start to uh, take the idea of possession, accumulating more and what have you, because you're trying to fill up within yourself what you think is missing instead of realizing that, yeah, we are complete. Absolutely, right? And, and I think that that's a great way to kind of read that text, you know, that the garden is a flourishing place where life is, is just abundant, you know, resources, so to speak, are abundant, the gifts of God are abundant, and everyone seems to have what they need. Um, but there's this sort of attempt that happens to get above our station. And that's what the serpent tempts, right, the, the first humans with is, well, you're not going to die. God said you're going to die. You're not going to die. If you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods, right? There's this promise of something more that is attractive. And, and when that is introduced, it leads to this uh, sort of decision again that wholeness that we already had, which, you know, as I said, Weirsba and others have commented, is sort of the antithesis of authentic gratitude, um, the ability to sort of live in gratitude for the gifts that God gives, for the gifts the earth gives, and to really let that be the starting point of our reflection on the meaning of humanity, on the meaning of, you know, on our place in the world. Um, so there's so much there that I think is, is kind of beneath the surface. We, we do have to be careful with these interpretations, of course. Um, but I do think that there's something really substantial there in that sort of first temptation and, and the effects of that temptation kind of as a reflection on the nature of sort of, the, not the human, not human nature, okay? I wanna, I, I, I don't buy that argument, but the human condition, right? The condition that we live within. I personally think that we're pretty good by nature and we just do a good job of fouling it up all the time. You know, it's a different way of, of looking at it, but the human condition, the conditions that we live in, it's wonderful. Other thoughts, comments, things we can discuss, or responses to each other? I'm totally happy with that as well. Let me ask this question to the group then, and maybe we'll get some thoughts going. Um, this is a text that's very, as Maria said, very familiar to people. You know, we all have heard this story, read this story countless, countless times. And, and I hope that, you know, as Maria kind of indicated, Arlene, too, that um, the, the way that we've read it tonight offers some new resources or sheds a little bit of new light or different light on kind of some of the things that we, we have learned. I'm curious, you know, as we think about the relationship between humans and God and the earth and the whole sort of ecosystem, the whole universe together and, and everything that we've been discussing, um, what do you think is some of the potential if we were to say, preach this or teach this in Sunday schools or parishes or our classrooms, or we heard it from the pulpit and that became the foundational understanding of how we think about Genesis two and three. Um, how might the church or the world or our understanding of the human vocation, any of those things, uh, be different? How might it change? We can be practical about this. You know, if we if we took some of this and really ran with it, what do you think would change? What would be different? I, I wonder whether one of the things we would want to change is to go back to chapter one and understand that and everything was good. Mm. To understand that the basic nature that we, if we have God's life and the breath of God is what keeps us in existence, we're good. And, and, and we spend too much time beating ourselves up, you know, and that's the tragedy of a lot of organized religion. We beat ourselves up instead of understanding the challenge to be who you are. You know, that stupid head they had on TV way back when uh, for the army, be, be what you can be. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, uh, I don't think we look at that. Mm. I love that starting with goodness, you know, as a foundation. And I also think sometimes we beat ourselves up for the wrong things. Personal opinion here, we should be beating ourselves up for patriarchy and ecological degradation, not for, you know, being in some, you know, and, and I mean that metaphorically, like you're working against it, you know, recognizing the harm, recognizing that those things are evils and working against them, not beating ourselves up for being in some sort of fallen state of, you know, 
uh, sinfulness before God. I mean, those things are sinful, right? But it's not about being in a state of sin versus being in a state of grace. It's about the actual concrete effects of our sinful choices, decisions on the world around us. And I think there's some prompting that when we recognize ourselves as good, it's easier to orient ourselves toward the good, to say yes to the good, you know, and, and then that allows us to discern more deeply what it also means to say no to these social and, and ecological and personal, you know, evils when they present themselves to us. And I'm kind of thinking in terms of Karl Rahner and Ignatian spirituality here, there's a lot of great, um, sort of spiritual and theological resources for, for thinking about this. You know, the uh, one quick thing, the Ignatian tradition gives us, you know, the enemy, this concept of the enemy. And often that gets kind of um, the word we would use like ontologized, turned into a being and people will associate it with, you know, Satan or evil or those kinds of things. But the way that Ignatius talks about it, and I think the way that the best interpretations of that spirituality talk about it um, is as, you know, the enemy of human nature is one way that people have, have understood this concept of the enemy, which is to John, to your point, the enemy of our true selves, the enemy of, of the, the, the goodness that is within us, which is that voice of God, that breath of God calling us into fulfillment and flourishing. And, and in that fulfillment and flourishing, that breaks out of itself, just like the love of God, the Trinitarian love of God breaks out of itself into creation. Our love breaks out of itself and spills forth into work for goodness, for justice, for mercy, for compassion, right? And that's our true self. And when we discern and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, as opposed to the enemy, right, which is the enemy is, is not necessarily Satan, the devil on your shoulder, right? You know, that classic image, um, but the enemy of us becoming who we truly are. And I think in some ways, the serpent kind of figuratively plays that role in the garden. The serpent is the tempter, the one that's drawing our attention away from whom we've been called to be and inviting us to try to be something else. Um, and there's this, so there's something to that, again, in this sort of figurative, mythical, mythic language of, of the text. I really appreciate that as well. I'd like to just say that you give uh, us great hope. Uh, those of us who have been working within the institution have had the challenges that that uh, offers us day in and day out, uh, and at times become very discouraged. Um, and what I'm taking away from this tonight, maybe you could say a bit more about it, is the importance of each one of us to believe that we have the potential individually to do what we can to bring about that change that the institution itself um, is not helping us right now, <laughs> but- uh, Put it mildly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But somehow to find a way to continue to have the courage and the conviction um, to be that Eve <laughs> uh, in, in the greatest sense that she could be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, would you say a bit more about that? Sure, I've got a couple of thoughts that come to mind. The first one, again, I'm, I'm in Rahner mode right now, I guess. Um, the first one is that Karl Rahner, Jesuit theologian, you know, hugely influential in, in Catholic theology, um, talks in, in his discussion of hope. Um, he says that, as you mentioned hope there, Mary Alice, um, in his discussion of hope, he says that the, the proper orientation of the Christian in the world is not optimism. It is rather a pessimistic realism. I love this line, <laughs> pessimistic realism, because if a person is truly to have authentic hope, meaning a profound, deep belief that motivates them toward action on behalf of a better future for the world in keeping with the proclamation of Jesus, then you have to really let the suffering and the struggle and the strife and our, our frustrations and all of the sort of, you know, dark elements of the age that we live in, of the church that we're members of, whatever it is, right? We have to take that seriously. We have to let that get inside of us. And even when it's uncomfortable, sort of sit with the reality of suffering 
and the reality of harm and the reality of injustice, because it's out of that that we can recognize the fullness of what Christian hope is really about, and that motivates us to action. That motivates us to meaningful work on behalf of change. So if you're ever tempted, you know, the serpent now is like, just be an optimist. Everything's getting better. You know, if that's what the serpent on your shoulder is ever saying to you, you can say, you know, not today, Satan, as people like to say, just, you know, there's a joke there. Uh, not today, Satan, you know, I'm actually not going to sugarcoat reality. I'm going to recognize the real suffering and sit with it and let it motivate me to discern how I can act and how my communities can act, how I can inspire others to act on behalf of a better future that is more consistent with the proclamation of life and flourishing and justice and mercy and compassion that Jesus himself proclaimed, that he lived for, that he taught, that he died for, all of those things, you know, and that ultimately culminates in, in the resurrection. It's because of his great love that that is, that that is brought about. So I think that there's some real wonderful, really wonderful resources in Rahner's account of hope for, for thinking about some of that stuff. So that's that's the first point. And the second point is briefer, um, which is I always, I gave a talk last night on what I to see at a local parish. Um, great, it was really well attended and, and we had a great time. And out of that, people were just so jazzed up and, uh, you know, ready to kind of go out and, and do things. And I, the, one of the last things I said to the group was just be radical. Like Pope Francis and Laudato Si reflecting on these texts that we too are reflecting on in different ways from how he uses them, but we're, we're looking at the same sources here, um, comes away calling for, right, a bold cultural revolution. And I just love that phrase. So be bold, be radical, take it all the way home, you know, and, and, and find little ways you can do this. You know, talking about this linkage between gender justice and ecological justice and, and the ways that Genesis 2 read alongside with Genesis 1 has been used as part of the justification for the exclusion of women from ordination in the church. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, one of the things that I, that I do as a sort of radical practice, and this may sound a little bit off the, off the deep end here to some people, is that I, I've made it a practice when I have the opportunity to turn to someone else at the end of mass and just say, isn't it terrible that we never have a woman up there presiding and breaking open the word for us? Just ask the question to someone I've never talked to before. And you would not believe the responses. You get everything from yes to sort of blank stares to all of this kind of stuff. But one of the things I've been thinking about is the radic how radical it is that certain things in our church have not just become impermissible or, you know, uh, you know we, we say that they're not possible, but that they're actually unimaginable. And I really think that sometimes, as you said, I mean, I work within the institution too, when I come up against, you know, these blockades, I'm always, I always think what a lack of imagination there. Before anything else, it's a lack of imagination. What a lack of sort of openness to the possibility of the spirit working. And I, I'm kind of going off, I'm very passionate about this, but the last thing I'll say in this is um, there's, a, there's a women's ordination movement and they have an Instagram account and I follow it and you kind of updates on, you know, all, the, all of their initiatives. The other day they posted, or a few weeks ago, they posted something that said, if you could ask church leaders to make a statement on one issue related to the ordination of women, what would it be? And the thing that came immediately to my mind was, I want a bishop or Pope Francis himself or somebody to say, I believe that it is impossible for the Holy Spirit to call a woman to ordained ministry in the Catholic Church, to say that publicly and out loud. That's a really big claim. <laughs> and I'm not ever going to make that claim. But if if a person wants to say, yeah, that's the way it is, then I don't know, I don't know where I'm going to go with that. But imagine the sort of audacity it would take to say yes, you know. Um, I, I think that whenever we frame things in these sort of more radical ways, there's there's just new things come up as uh, imaginables, you know, that we, we don't often uh, think about. And so we're kind of far afield here from the ecology piece, but it's all interconnected in this logic. Um, and, and those are some of my reflections in response to that question. Yeah, please, Tuni. 
Oh, you're on mute. Uh, mute uh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. now we can hear you. Okay, um, talking about, we talk about technology and also ecology. So what's your opinion on where we need to draw between, you know, like the heirloom variety of things versus genetically modified mm -hmm. organism and things like that? So I, I, I just like to pick your brain on that yeah. issue. I'm happy to offer a quick response. I'd love to hear what other people, if you've if you've done thinking about this or reflection on this, please please share as well. Um, my answer is this: the first principle for all of these decisions um, is what decision in this situation promotes the greatest flourishing of life, the greatest sort of intersectional justice for people and for the earth. Um, thinking about issues of poverty, you know, Pope Francis's linkage between the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Um, you know, Karl Rahner has, again, a, a reflection in a, in a text where he talks about buying bananas and how, you know, buying bananas, or, you know, is always going to be an unethical act because of all the interconnected systems of oppression and harvesting and guard, like, it, there's no way out, right? So what is it that is the most liberating, flourishing, promoting, life-giving decision in this thing? That's the broad ethical principle, okay? Now, I think that whenever we think about that, we have to think about it holistically. So we're thinking about the health of the land. We're thinking about um, the payment of laborers who are working to cultivate crops. We're thinking about um, the pollution from say, transporting something from you know one end of the country to the other so that you can have apples all year round versus choosing not to buy apples whenever they're not in season or something like that. Right. That's another sort of concrete manifestation. And then as far as the sort of specific GMO dimension goes, you know, I, I hear Pope Francis's point in Laudato Si that there's a jury is kind of still out on this kind of stuff. But I would say this, to the extent that GMO based products rely on fundamentally destructive and exploitative logics that they, they, they sort of say, let's beat the earth into submission and make it do what we want it to do. Right. Um, whether that is through, you know, like I was talking about like monoculture crops that can resist everything and you can dump pesticides on them and wreck the topsoil. I don't think that, that that's ethical if that's what we're talking about when we're talking about GMOs. But there may be more ethically produced possibilities as far as GMOs go. Um, that that would be you know worthy of of consideration and possibly worthy of you know um, consumption and things like that. So I don't have a clear kind of hard line answer to that. Um, but those are some of the those are some of the considerations I would raise in thinking about it. Okay, thanks. And speaking of banana, um, yeah. I grew up in Indonesia, and we had uh, being in a tropic, we have a, a variety of banana that is just delicious and very flavorful and i was shocked when i came to the united states and tasted banana and i said i couldn't believe the flavor this is not fruit <laughs> <laughs> it's so true i have friends from indonesia and i have a lot of filipinos in my life and uh they say the same thing whenever you eat a banana for the first time in the u.s you think what is this correct, correct. <laughs> sure isn't and, a and I know. Yeah. sadly enough uh for whatever reason, the um, the corporate, you know, or the agriculture corporation, um, they brought the variety as known in the United States as Cavendish banana to my home country, and and it took over. It's planted there. It just it took over, and and people are having a hard time finding the variety that we grew up with. Yeah. And that is sad. Yeah, it is sad. And a great example of biodiversity loss and corporate interest coming together. That's great. So right. I think we have we have time for maybe yeah. one last question, or if anybody wants to comment further on the GMO stuff, um, you'd be welcome to do that. Uh, yeah. Elizabeth, Thanks. yes, please. Elizabeth Patty. One of my questions, what had to do with, uh, we talk about beating ourselves up, at least in terms of the, um, I keep wondering about our Eucharist. And it seems like we forever go on 
about Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's almost like we don't believe that we are um, forgiven, that we are received, that we, it, it just, it, it, throughout the whole year, we end up um, not worthy. And it, it seems like it's very destructive of ever moving forward. I find it really frustrating. Along with petitions, a lot of times we're asking God somewhere out there to do what we're supposed to be doing ourselves. Mm. And um, it, it seems like the whole thing has to be revamped in new ways to make it so that it's um, a life-giving, affirming experience. Thanks. I completely you're you're speaking to my liturg little liturgist heart here as as you say those things. I started out, you know, as a liturgist and liturgical musician, and I'll yeah, I'll, I'll just a brief response to that would be one: the prayers of the faithful, or the universal prayer, as we now call it, is one of the few aspects of the liturgy that we have creative control over from week to week. Someone in our parish is coordinating that or writing those prayers, and my all directive is always that those prayers should start by asking, but then also incorporate us as the objects of the transformation. So whatever we ask of God, we should connect with our agency. We should connect with our responsibility. And if the prayers in your parish are just sort of, you know, asking God for things without ever sort of inviting us to reflect on ourselves, then I think there's a gap there. There's a practical gap because as you say, Elizabeth, it should motivate us to action. We're asking God for things we should be doing ourselves. Well, guess what? We can rewrite those prayers. We have creative control week to week over those prayers. So that's a conversation all of us can start in our parishes, institutions, schools, whatever it is, because that, there are different ways, there are different approaches, and some are better than others liturgically in this terms of you know, motivating ourselves to action. So that's the one thing I'll say. And the second thing I'll say is to wrap us up that as we think about you know, liturgy, Lord have mercy, Christ. And one of my earliest sort of formation experiences was with a, a Jesuit scholar of the liturgy. And, and I'll just say this is kind of a fun place to end. He said, you know, whenever we, there's two ways to think about Lord have mercy. One is, you know, breastfeeding, you know, Western sort of on our knees, Lord have mercy, I'm so fallen and bad and all these things beating ourselves up. The other way is to think of Lord have mercy and Christ have mercy. And it, he, this is a, a, a black man speaking, you know, from his own cultural tradition in, in the mode of um, an elderly black woman rejoicing over something that has happened. Lord have mercy, you know, that this is a good thing. This, you know, Christ have mercy, you know, because it is an evocation of the grace that God has given us even more so that it's an evocation of our own sort of fallenness and flaw. So, you know, there are ways that we can emphasize that. I mean, obviously we can't tell presiders to say it in that way or something like that, but the meaning, the significance, we can reflect on that in different ways. And I hope that, you know, with this session and as we go forward, we'll be able to do that more and more. So um, for next week, again, the texts we're going to be focusing on are the Psalms that I'll drop in the chat one more time. If you want to jot those down and um, we will meet again at this time and, and gather to discuss. Yeah. And if you take the text out of the chat, uh, because I'm not sure when you see the recording, you're going to be able to open that up and look at them. So uh, we have two options here. Paul, you have access to everybody's email right uh through spirit alive educator is that correct i do have access to that account so yeah i could send it yeah out. so yeah. just in case anybody needs it maybe you could say sometime by saturday or so you'll just cut and paste and send it out as an email in case people uh don't have a pen or a pencil to jot everything down because i don't think they're going to get to see it okay all right yes everybody, all right thank you all night Thank you for Good coming night. to Spirit Alive. Keep the spirit alive. See you next week. Amen. Bye. See ya. Thank you so much.